so things haven't turned out as you hoped. Life took a turn. A bum. And a darkened sky. And at times it may have seemed there was no hope. But here's the good news. Our God is the God of fresh starts. Our God is the God of new beginnings. Our God brings new mercies, new compassions, not just once a year, not just when things are bad. But every single morning, this season has been tough. And for many of us, things will never be the same. But we are here breathing. Greetings and good morning to you all as we begin to gather here this morning together in hopes of identifying and looking at how we can all live a life of contentment. May God grant us all understanding this morning as we dig into his word that we may not only be hearers of the word, but doers as well. You know, we have surely been living in this last few months, almost a year now, in a heightened sense of awareness, worried and concerned about the status of this latest virus making its way across the world, the elections, even the weather in recent weeks. When fear grips us, no wonder we get paralyzed. We become irrational. We try to store things away, often way more than we need. And most importantly, we forget about other people. You know, nothing worse than a national or a world crisis to help bring out the worst in humankind. Yet the Bible is clear on many occasions that we should not fear, but instead trusting God, seeking that he may be found. And so I believe that it is very timely that before these situations we find ourselves today, that God has granted this message on contentment. Contentment, you see, is about learning to be aware of God's goodness, regardless of what we may be going through. Accepting his good plan for us and patiently waiting for his good gifts, no matter what may be all around us. There's a key word there, right? Good. Yet, before we can get into that place of peace and freedom, we first need to identify and deal with our own regrets, our angers, our own consequences, usually due to our own past actions. Why? Why must we work through these three different things? Because if we don't, then the enemy of this world is going to use those things against us to prevent us from acquiring the very thing which we seek, which is contentment, a deeper awareness of the presence of God in each of our lives. So let's look at each one of these just uh, elements briefly before we get deeper into this subject of contentment that I know we all desire. Let me ask you this. Have you ever wondered why it is that we feel regrets or anger? Why must there be consequences in life? I believe it comes down to the basic concept that we learn in school called cause and effect. In fact, one of the basic tenets of physics 
means that every action has an opposite and equal reaction. Now, this is not a physics class, but it's wonderful for us to notice that. Because cause and effect or equal reaction, they both those things reminds us that what we do always carries a consequence, whether it is a positive thing or a negative thing. If I drink too many liquids, then I'm going to have to go use the restroom a lot, right? If I overindulge and I overeat, well, I'm going to put on a couple of extra pounds. Now, I can testify that that one is true for a fact. If I don't wash my hands regularly, then I am more bound to get risk, increase my risk of getting sick more often. If I make choices that take me away from the will of God for my life, then I will find myself in a lost and depraved world without the safety and protection of my Heavenly Father. Well, you know where we're going with this, right? Usually that's when we get ourselves into trouble. Often, for many of us, we end up living our lives as a result of the choices that we made before, whether they're good choices or bad choices, and sometimes wishing that we could change them, hoping that we could somehow go back in time and do something different. But what hope is there in changing the past? If we do, that means if all we ever hope for is to go back and fix yesterday, then we are surely going to miss the opportunities of today. Now, the past cannot be changed, but we can learn from it, and we can make appropriate course corrections today to ensure we, ens we, we have a better future to walk into. Therefore, let us make amends when possible, make adjustments in our lives as necessary so that we will not make the same mistakes again and again and live in fear and in regret and in bad consequences. If we choose not to, then we will live with regret. We will live with anger. We will truly be stuck in that past and living in fear, really. For you see, contentment then becomes the hope for the possibility. And there it is again of God's goodness that is yet to come. Does that make sense to us? Does that mean then more that we will no longer feel regret? Well, I hope less and less as we learn to lean on God's future for us and not our own choices. Does it mean that we will not experience anger or fear anymore? Well, no, not really. We still need to control those emotions as we carry on developing our lives as children of God. What about consequences? Well, they're still going to be around. And God in his mercy and grace may choose to spare us from some of them. But even if he doesn't, we must learn to find peace no matter what our circumstances may be. And that's where contentment comes in. In fact, the Apostle Paul said it best in the passage that my beautiful wife read to us today. Whether full or hungry or in plenty or in poverty, in need or having more than enough, I can do all things, he says, through Christ who gives me strength. You see, contentment comes when we adequately use the resources that God makes available to us. And so in verse 19 of our passage for today, Paul reminds us that it is God who will provide for our every need according to his ability, according to his endless availability, and never ours. And so today I simply want to share with you these four uh, P words, as I call them, or P statements that will hopefully remind us on a daily basis of what these godly resources that are available for us in order that we may achieve contentment. And yes, especially in the midst of a world crisis and everything that we're going through. And so the four statements that I want to share with you are simply this. God's prevenient grace, God's overruling providence, God's unfailing power, and his unchanging promises. So let's look at them individually one by one. And so first, what is prevenient grace? Well, you know, this is a beautiful theological term that comes from the Wesleyan tradition of which we in this pre methodist back ministry claim our theological background is based on. It is a concept of the grace that comes before. Before, that is, we even knew that we needed grace in our lives. It is the work of the Holy Spirit of God in the life of the unbeliever. It is that gentle whisper, that intentional nudge that gets us from a deprived place to perhaps a single thought in our minds that may say, I wonder what this Jesus is all about. Or maybe even perhaps to realizing in our heads and saying something like well i know i'm walking wrong down the wrong path in my life maybe i should change maybe i should find some help so the first resource that god makes available to us 
to every person in creation is a research that we truly do not comprehend until we look back into our lives and see what God has brought us through. It is a bit of a paradox, really, if you think about it that way, and it is prevenient grace. Like any form of grace, we do not deserve it. We do not earn it. And yet God still freely gives it. We often say, when speaking about our conversion to Christianity, when I first came to Jesus, when I first accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and and while these are accurate statements, they make it sound as if it was something that we had to do in the matter, when in fact, it was God who called us to himself first. You see, elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus reminds us that we love, not because we're made out of love, but because God first loved us. Jesus Christ came to the earth almost 2,000 years ago, and yet his work of grace still applies to us today. We did not ask for it, yet it is available to all and every human being if we simply accept it. Through prevenient grace, the Holy Spirit shows us where divine righteousness may be found. He seeks us before we seek him. He encourages us to accept the love's father. You see, righteousness is one of those big church words, right? This simply means, that reminds us, if you will, of the way that we should live, the right way, the God way. A simple way that is given to us through the Ten Commandments. A statement that is even later on simplified further by Christ when he quotes Old Testament scripture and says, love God and love your neighbor. How can we live such basic command once when we still fail to fulfill them from time to time? Well, because together with God's prevenient grace comes his sustaining or his continuing grace where he strengthens us for the task ahead in direct correlation to our faith, faithful service to him. Remember Jesus' word. He says, I go so that my father will send you a helper. This is the Holy Spirit of God who comes to help us. And we think we are meeting him for the first time. But in reality, he has already ministered to us by showing us the first step into contentment. When we find ourselves in dark and lost world and with no hope in sight. For you see, God has the power, says the scripture, to provide you with more than enough of every kind of grace. That way you will have everything you need, everything and always in everything you provide more than enough for every kind of good work, says 2 Corinthians 9, 8. The Spirit's job is first to introduce us to the Father's love but also to speak to us about his judgment and convict us of that reality. Because we are not saved so that we may simply go on living the same deprived life. No, but so that we may help others to turn around and like us, daily seek the grace of God through his gift of contentment. My friends, I don't believe that it's an accident you and I are here today or later on as you listen to this message. For you see, God knows how and when to rescue the godly from their trials and when and how to punish the wicked, says 2 Peter 2, 9. Do you want to learn contentment? Then accept the fact that God is actively seeking to be in fellowship with you and live your life accordingly and you will be well on your way. Yes, Life will still happen. It always does around us. But now we will have hope. We will have understanding in this second P word that I want to share with us today. And that is understanding of God's overruling providence. What is providence? It's truly another one of these beautiful, exploding with meaning word, with wonderful meaning. It is a noun. It is a word of action that reminds us of God's protective care for his creation. It is an older word, but one that carries great meaning still today. You may have heard it before used as destiny or fate, maybe even God's will. And it is truly all of those things. But most importantly, the providence of God is the second valuable resource that we have in our journey to experiencing contentment in life. His providence is complete. It is eternal. It is overarching. Nothing can change it. Nothing can overrule it. It is truly what God has purposed for us as his children. 
God's providence reminds us that he is in control and that no matter what terrible things we may have done, no matter what terrible things we may be going through, no matter how terribly we may have messed up, no matter what the latest fear that circumvented the world may be threatening our safety, he remains in control. He is sovereign, and in his providence, he can perceive all of our actions, all of their consequences, and as we seek to grow closer to him, he can weave them back together into his perfect will for our lives. You see, contentment has always been part of God's plan from his creation. Think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Eden. Is there a better imagery of contentment than what we read in the first few chapters of Genesis? Later on throughout the scriptures, God continues his attempts of restoring people, humanity back to him, to the teachings of the prophets, to the coming of Jesus, to the promise of heaven. You see, it is all designed to bring us to a place of peace, a place of safety, of serenity and eternal security, truly a place of contentment. And for this reason, because of God's providence, the Apostle Paul reminds the church in Rome that there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Since Jesus paid the price that we deserve as dictated by the law, he fulfilled the sacrifice, Romans 8, 1 through 4, that law should bring us to a place of peace. You see, we all at times have had regrets and feel anger at our past actions. We have given into fears. We have faced with uncertainty. Yet God knows our every thought and intention. And still he says, if you accept my gift of salvation, there is no condemnation for you. No need to worry. No need to live a life separated from my providential care, he says. It is like going before a judge and knowing that all of the evidence points to a sure death penalty. And then all of a sudden, the judge not only cancels the debt, but goes further and takes upon the punishment that it came for you. This is unheard of, right? Of course, in the human realities, but that's exactly what Jesus does, what God does through his sons for each one of, us, one of us. And all we have to do is repent and seek him, the true and only God who looks out to the possibility and not what we did in the past. But in Jesus, we are forgiven and we're given, as the video said, a new opportunity for a new beginning. Remember the way of righteousness I mentioned before, love God and love your neighbor. The consequence for not doing so, says the scripture, is truly death. Yet God paid our price, my friends, through his grace and because of his providence, he chose to rescue us in spite of us. Think about that statement and the implications that it should have upon our lives. God chose to save us in spite of us. The effects that it should have upon our faith and how we live our lives since being rescued from our depravity is unique. Unlike anything that the world can ever offer us. And so therefore we know that faith is the single-minded ability to believe that God will lead us as we go where he leads us. That he will protect us along the way just as he did with many in scripture including the man named Abraham. You see faith is a trust exercise. And in the face of difficulties and trials, as we grow in our knowledge of God, we will find that our faith will also grow one situation to the next. We will learn that it is God's providence that has guided us through an encouragement of the Holy Spirit. So that the same spirit has helped us to make better choices, which of course produce more positive outcomes, more God-centered results in our lives. You know, can we believe in this simple truth? How can we possibly come to understand and accept these? Because of the third P word that I want to share with you, and that is God's un failing power. You see, his prevenient grace, his all overruling providence is all based on his unfailing power. We tend to have very limited view, field of view over our lives. In fact, we often get frustrated when we cannot see a few steps in front of our face. Our decision-making process is limited by our own abilities to understand where our choices will lead us. And yet this third resource that God makes available to each of us in order to achieve contentment is found in his life-giving power. 
Yahweh, you see, is everywhere. He knows all things. He knows the worst in us, and yet he still loves us. Our job is to get a, to a spiritual place, if you were, where we learn to trust this unfailing power, this essence of mercy and grace, because God is eternal, you see. So his essence, his grace, his power will never run out. Scientists tells us that our own sun, you know, beautiful thing in the sky, will consume all of his internal energy in about 2 billion years. And it will just begin to expand and eventually collapse upon itself. You see, something as big as the sun can and will run out of power. And this is a magnificent celestial representation to us of God's own power for us as human, tiny human beings. And yet it will consume itself one day, but the power of the one that made it will not. Because the creator has an unlimited source of power. We can trust in his grace, trust in his will, for he sees the best in us, even when we cannot see it ourselves. And as we have seen and actively are working at transforming us into what he hopes we will be. When we teach our children to walk and they fall, we do not fault them. But we help them up and we encourage them to keep on trying, to keep on succeeding. God does the same with us. Yet the enemy of the world will point the fact that we fell. And sometimes we believe his lies. Sometimes we stay down. And yet God is more powerful than we could ever imagine. And God doesn't look at the fact that we fail. But he looks at our possibility at the firm hope that he is planting in our hearts. And therefore, scripture says that God knows what he is going to make of us. God is determined to make us like Christ, Romans 8, 29. God's redemption begins with his election of us which is a full circle from his prevenient grace. First, he helps us to turn to him. Then he calls us to salvation, to justification, and eventually to what we call sanctification, which is the day we get to go to heaven, which lands us securely in our final P word for this morning, and that is God's unchanging promises. I hope you've been taking some notes because I've shared with you quite a few promises from God's word along the, this passage today. And you see, the entire Bible is a promise of God. It is the basic instructions before we leave earth. I love this, uh, this little uh, graphic here that we're showing you. The best way then to discover God's promises is to live them out, is to read them, to study his word. So if you're not doing that, how can you experience them? I mean, I can tell you about them, and you can try to grasp their meaning for a time, but when you truly hide God's word in your heart, it will help you to understand and practice and utilize these resources that he gives us for our daily walk. This is the easiest one, I think, for us to follow. We just have to do it. We must study God's word daily. If we don't, then we will grow indifferent, says Acts eleven seventeen. 17. And when we grow indifferent, we will quickly lose hope. Much like the world sees, seems to be doing lately. We must study God's word in full detail. Study the gospel, study the Psalms, the books of the law. Then study as we are doing today and focus on key words. Words like contentment, words like righteousness, words like fear not. Which, by the way, is used over 300 times in the Bible. We're going to be putting a lot of these smaller studies into our website, 217faith.church. Hopefully, you'll be able to enjoy those and use them as you seek to minister to others. Next, we must study God's word thoroughly. All scripture says, 1 Timothy 3, 16, is inspired by God from beginning to end. Don't skip around, but seek to understand God's complete plan for humanity in his word. It's all connected from Genesis to Revelation. We must study then God's word prayerfully. We are actually meeting with God when we read his word. So as you read it, pray. As you come across something that you may not understand, seek his guidance. If you read something that convicts you, then stop and pray for God's grace and forgiveness. We must study God's word, the Bible, with full obedience. You must be doers of the word, says James 1.22. And not just hearers. We cannot be doers if we don't understand what the word says. Do not merely seek to validate your choices or find the verses that prove your theories. Allow God to guide you as his Holy Spirit to encourage you. And then live your life for him according to what you learn. Anything you may miss in life because you are being obedient to the promises of God. Trust me, it's insignificant when compared to the everlasting goodness 
and provisions of God. For freedom, Christ has set us free, said Galatians 5.1. Therefore, cast off all of your old desires and rebellions so that we may become obedient towards God. Because before we were slaves to sin, Romans 8.34, but now we are restored to his family. That should bring us peace. Because of the sacrifice of Christ, God will clothe us with his righteousness. He will grant us his contentment if we but depend on the resources that he grants us. You see, sometimes the resources are hidden and we have to search them out. That's why we study the word. That's why we listen to messages. That's why we pray. Think about this. A tree digs its roots deep into, to find water and minerals that it needs to survive. Streams of waters, they find their sources in far away snow-capped mountains and sometimes deep in the land. The warmth we feel when we step outside travels over 90 million miles to get to us. Through trials and testing, we are initiated, as Paul calls it, into the wonderful secret of contentment. He says, for I have learned the secret of being content. Paul says, because I can indeed do everything that God asked of me to do with the help of Christ who grants me strength and power. Be therefore, my friends, content in all things, through all of your needs, for God has promised to never abandon us or forsaken us, Deuteronomy 31.6. And then the scripture says that we will be able to proclaim with full assurance, the Lord is with me, I won't be afraid. What can anyone do? do to me let us then practice not living in fear but in full trust of god in contentment there's an old hymn of the church that reminds me and hopefully reminds us of the state of mind that we possess when we seek the contentment of christ and it says when peace like a river attends the way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot you have taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul. Verse 2 says, though Satan may buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. And as a result, we say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That is contentment, my friends. I can only imagine what you may be going through physically, emotionally, spiritually. There is certainly plenty to worry about according to the world's events. Yet this is our opportunity that we all have today to seek to change that. Not in our own abilities, but by trusting in the resources that God freely gives us. The resources of God's prevenient grace, his overruling power, his unfailing uh, overruling providence and unfailing power and his unchanging promises. My prayer today is that together we may find contentment simply in knowing that we can bring each other up to God as a community of believers and lift each other up as we walk the path he sets for us, that, that we can trust that not, not only does he come with us, but he goes before us so that we can be more and more like Christ. You see, he is here with us. He is listening to us as you are listening these words, as you are on the road, as he sets us on this path of contentment, if we only choose to accept this invitation. And so I say, would you accept that right now? Good Father, I accept your call to contentment. Lord, it is not going to remove all the pain in this world, no. That will happen one day when we come to your presence in heaven. But I ask today that through your contentment, that we may find the help we need to make it through this life. Help me, Lord, to always trust in you, in your prevenient grace, in your providence and everlasting power. And most of all, in your unchanging promises that all will work out according to your good and perfect will for those who you call and accept your free wish, free will through Jesus Christ. Lord, we take our first step in faith today. We accept your free gift of hope, of grace, of which Jesus brings us. Help us now to live our lives from this day forth for your honor and for your glory. Especially during the uncertainties that surrounds us this day. Grant us your peace, Lord, for we ask it in the precious name of he who understood contentment better than anyone else, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
Amen. Amen. As always, we thank you so much for joining us today, and we pray that you will continue to be a part of these online efforts. We ask for your help to invite others to spread the words, to share these postings, to go on 217faith.church and begin to help us to spread these words so that we may all become more productive servants of God. Please send us your prayers, your requests, your questions, your comments. We truly want to hear from you. We want to engage with you. May you have, we pray, a blessed rest of this day and week to come in the full assurance of God's contentment. And we look forward to seeing you next Sunday, March the 7th, 1115, live here on Facebook or through our Zoom and other areas. All of these social platforms that we believe God will use for the advancement of this kingdom. And so we finish just by saying, may God bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his spirit make his face to shine upon you and grant you contentment until we see you again. God bless you. Bye-bye.